We're going to have um, some fun today. We begin a brand new series entitled Moments. Everybody say Moments. And it is those moments in life, much like what Garrison was saying, that when you make a decision to step out, to take a risk, to inconvenience yourself or kind of put yourself on the edge, it's in those moments of life where you are truly transformed when you experience the love of God, the power of God, um, all these things that we'll talk about in this series, and so I want you to kind of make a commitment with yourself that uh, you'll join us for the next three weeks, that you'll even kind of step out, maybe invite somebody. If you're online and you're trying to make the decision whether you join us live or not, we would love for you to come and join us live. There is something powerful about technology, but there is something super powerful about being together as a faith family, faith family worshiping together. So join us, come for the next three weeks. It's going to be super, super powerful. If you're here and you have like a pipe, paper, paper, man, that was Tanner all the way. Okay, so if you have like a paper, book, Bible, um, we're going to be in a, in a few different scriptures. We're going to be in 2 Timothy and Luke and Matthew. However, if you have an electronic device, um, something like an iPad, iPhone, whatever, you can pull up our Epic Church app and click on the little icon at the bottom that says media, and then it'll bring up a screen. There'll be like several little tabs, and then click on, um, I think it says Sunday notes or this week's notes or something like that. Click on that, and you can pretty much follow along with most of the things that I will say. I'm not going to say that I'll keep exactly how it's written, but it'll be, it'll be super, super close. And then I would love for you to kind of um, maybe screenshot those, get them for yourself, and have a discussion. I'm really going to challenge you to have a discussion um, with yourself, with God, with family, with friends after the service is over with. Maybe today, maybe Wednesday, maybe Thursday, but before you come back, have a discussion about the points that we went over, especially in this particular series, because we're going to um, challenge ourselves to really live without compromise. Everybody say compromise. In week three, we're going to hammer that a little bit and, and really talk about what that's about, but we got to, I mean, you know, sometimes we got to build on things before, so we can handle the real conversation. It's not that today won't be a real conversation, but don't miss week three because everything will come to a head. It'll, it'll, um, it'll be a huge, great faith explosion on week three, so please make sure that you're with us that week. And so I went and um, I was researching, and here's how we got the titles to these conversations. So today's title is called No Reserves. Next week will be No Retreat, and week three will be No Regrets. And I, I was reading about a young man named William, William Borden. Anybody ever heard of him? Just real quick. Okay. Um, no worries. He would be what is known as like a, um, a missionary that didn't quite get it done. That's how most people look at him. But the truth is... The words that I just recited, he actually wrote in the back of his Bible. His mom found it. And the, his story and those three quotes have inspired missionaries all around the world. So a life that looked like a failure actually was a huge success when you look at it, when you look at it from an eternal perspective. So just real quick, William Borden was actually born a millionaire. He was born a millionaire because of who his family was, and he was set to take over the company, the, the family fortune, as soon as he graduated from college. Um, as a graduation gift, his parents gave him a trip around the world. Who's down for that? He's like, okay, parents send me to Spain. It'll be awesome. So he went to a trip, and Borden, being a Christ follower already, had a burden for lost people. He wanted to see people experience Jesus all around the world. Upon his return from his, his little world trek, he decided not to take the, uh, the family inheritance, but to actually go and study to be a missionary. At which point, his dad said, if you do this, you'll never see a dime of my money. I will disown you. In his Bible, he wrote these words, no reserves. So he, he went to Yale, and going to Yale, he graduated and was still kind of pressing in. I don't want the family business. I want to go and be a missionary. And he wrote these words, kind of in that stage of his life, no retreat. And then he goes on to Princeton Seminary, and he studies Arabic so that he can go to Egypt and reach the Muslim nation. That's who he discovered he had a heart for. That's who he wanted to go communicate with and live with. So he, he moves to Egypt, and he contracts a disease, um, spinal meningitis at 25, and never actually gets to be a missionary. But the last phrase he writes in his Bible is, no regrets. His mom later gets that Bible. She shares it with people. And those three fra phrases, those three quotes, have inspired missionaries all around the world. His story, which would look or sound like a failure, 
actually, in hindsight, is a super, super powerful life lived for Jesus. So what we need to understand is no matter what you do, no matter what it plays out to look like, a life lived for Christ is never, ever wasted. So, so you may think, man, it's not working out. People are not coming like I think they should. I'm, I'm sharing, I'm doing, and I'm not seeing a lot of results. You never know what results will manifest themselves 10 years later, 20 years later, or 70 years later. And that's kind of how we have to live when we're following Christ. We have to live from this eternal perspective. And what we're going to talk about today is living a life with no reserves. Now, I think you should probably do that as, like, if you're going to drive a car. Who in here has a car? Here's my recommendation. Never park your car in your driveway in less than half a tank. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what you need to get. You need to, guys, teach your sons that, okay? Um, help your wife with that. Okay, like... Pay attention to where a gas needle is because you know what? She does it. So you have to like pay attention to that. So I, I think there are some realities that we should have from some reserves. I think that it's important that we teach, we, we live a life with margin, that you're not always running up to the red line, that you put space in your calendar to capitalize on opportunities. Like, like I believe all of that, but there is this tension or even dichotomy in the Bible where we're called to live a life full but die on empty. Like live every day like it's your last. And we don't really understand that. We don't comprehend that because we live in the deception that tomorrow is coming. But the truth is, I mean, you know, it's just not guaranteed. Like that's the truth. We don't like to live in that. And I'm not saying live, live it from a negative standpoint. I don't believe in negative motivation. I believe in positive motivation. Don't, don't live fearing death, but live knowing that every day counts for eternity. Live every day, you can still live every day like it's your last, or you can live every day like it's your first. I mean, you don't remember your first day. You don't remember your first day of life. You don't remember your first, probably first day of kindergarten. You don't remember your first day of high school. But how many know that sometimes, sometimes, not always, we could talk about tragedy, the first of my tragedy, but how many know the first day of a new adventure, you live it like it's going to go away? Like, how many remember your first day of vacation? Like, when you go on the first day, you're like, I got to do all this stuff. Okay, and then you kind of you get to the end of vacation and you're coasting and you're like, oh, okay, whatever, and then all of a sudden it's over. So like I say, live every day like it's your first. That mentality of, man, I'm in a new adventure, it's a new thing, that's why God says his mercies are new, I say new, every day. Why? So that you'll take risks, that you'll get outside the box, that you know when you mess up, it's not really a mess up. What do you mean? Oh, God promises to work all things together for your good. So even, even if you, here's what people live all the time. I don't want to mess up. How many of you ever think this way? I don't want to do it wrong. Well, how about you just do it? And, and let God's grace and mercy follow you around. Anybody read Psalms 23? Like, like it says that last line, and grace and mercy will chase me all the days of my life. I just believe in living wide open. Look at your neighbor and say, live wide open. So to understand that, you have to look in scriptures and see this, um, I can use the word radical, I can use the word crazy, I can use the word ridiculous, but you see this radical devotion that God asks of us to him. So I'm going to read three verses of scripture, it's actually in Luke and then in Revelations and then in Matthew, and Luke 9.62 says, but Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back, I'm going to say looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Revelations 12, 11. Some of you know this verse. You've quoted it before. And they have defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by their testimony. Who's heard that part? Okay. Line two. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Matthew 16, 25. If you hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for Jesus' sake, you will save it. So in Scripture, there is this call, this invitation to a party, to a gathering, to a table. There's all these analogies used in Scripture, but the truth is there is an invitation to a life that is radical, that is without compromise, that is sold out, that is all in, and we don't understand that primarily because we live in the United States of America. That's just the truth. Um, we have, a, we have, a, we, we have a, a phrase that we don't allow to be said in our home. Um, how many of you have ever been hungry? No, no, I didn't say starving, I said hungry. How are you hungry right now? 
Okay, you should have eaten breakfast. But anyway, so, all right. <laughs> so, so we understand, okay, I'm hungry, but m- how many of you have children? How many of you ever heard this phrase? I'm starving to death. <laughs> have you ever heard that? And you, like, you refrain from smacking them across the head because you, what do you know? You're not, you're not, A, you're not starving. Okay? And B, you don't even know what it is to starve to death. And so um, one of the greatest gifts we ever gave our children is we took them to Africa. And they got to see starving. I mean, real life starvation and death because of starvation. So now, if, if my children say, or even if one of us say, because I'll get hungry. I mean, I know you get hungry. Okay? And somebody says, I'm starving. We look at them to shame them. How many have that look as a parent to make them feel terrible? Like you just got that look. Listen, shame's okay sometimes, not all the time. Benay.marsh at epicchurch.tv. She can help you. But I'm just telling you, you can look at your kid like, you're not, what are you doing? Okay? So we look at them like that and they'll go, okay, okay, I'm American starving. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? I'm, a, I'm American starving. What does that mean? I hadn't eaten two hours. And I think I'm like, my stomach's eating my spleen. I don't know what's happening in there. I guess some craziness. So, why is that important? Because we, and I'm not saying there are not people in the United States that don't deal with serious hunger and starvation. What I'm saying is, is by and large from a population, we don't understand starvation. And the truth is we don't understand discomfort. We don't understand persecution. We don't understand being all in in anything. Which is why divorce is just as prevalent in the church as it is in regular society. We don't understand till death do us part. Most of the time it's till you get on my nerves we part. We don't don't understand the call inside of Scripture, not Christianity, but in Scripture where Jesus says you got to forsake all and follow. Like there are some pretty stout Scriptures that we'll get to, and this is not to make anybody feel bad. This is to help us understand the tension that we have to live in and also understanding the culture in which we're set in where we don't understand it. Because at best, we deal with inconveniences as American. I mean, my latte didn't come out right. Right? Hey, you brought me my cheeseburger with no bacon and I asked for it. Hey, my, my job is making me work four tens instead of five eights. My, my kid doesn't act right, and I'm having to go to school to talk to the teacher and have a parent-teacher conference and whatever, whatever you want to put in it. The truth is, those are really just inconveniences. And in no way am I being insensitive that sometimes there are people and in instances where it's not an inconvenience, it is a real trial, it is a real tragedy. But by and large, when it comes to following Jesus, we don't know what it means to have death threats. We don't know what it means that... I'm going to come and worship, and somebody could break in here and beat all of us because we chose Jesus. That my life is threatened if I utter the name Jesus. Everywhere else in the known world, for the large part, outside of the United States of America, that is a reality for people who choose Jesus. And we can't fill churches because we have to wear a mask. We can go to Africa right now to our East Watini campus and you will see people, they're running two services right now, and you will see people sitting in the building and you will see people sitting outside the building on logs because they want to hear about Jesus. I'm not trying to make anybody feel mad. What I'm saying is, is there's a call in Scripture that I believe the world is making us choose right now. Choose Jesus or don't. And I actually think that's the love of God. I actually think that's the grace of God and the mercy of God to separate those who are at best lukewarm, those who are actually cold and are playing a game, and the ones that are hot. And so what does that mean? You have to, you have to be willing to live every day and leave it all on the field. How many know what that term means? Let's leave it all on the field. Like, how many of you ever heard this phrase? Give it 110%. Have you ever heard that? Okay, let me set you free. That's a lie. All you got's 100. How many know that? Like, all I got's 100, okay? So I can't give 110. But what, they, what they're doing, the motivational people in your life, is they're realizing at best you give 80, so I'm trying to extend it over so you'll actually land on 100. The goal in following Christ is to give it 100% every day, live it like it's my first or my last, whatever motivates you, put it all on the field, and leave the day exhausted. 
Leave, leave this life living it full but dying absolutely on empty. At the end of Apostle Paul's life, he communicates that to us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, Paul says to, to his spiritual son Timothy, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and that the time of my departure is at hand. So let me just, let me just he's about to die. He's in prison. He knows it's coming. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. This is, this is kind of like the last words Paul's speaking, this is farewell address, and he's saying to Timothy, look, I have lived life full and I'm dying on empty. There, I don't have anything else to give. I have poured it all out. I have gone the extra mile. I have pressed in and fought the only fight that I've been asked to ever fight, and that's the fight of faith. And I am telling you, Timothy, to fan into flames the gift that your grandmother and your mom put in you and to fight the, the fight of faith as hard as you can and never, ever be ashamed of your age, but press in every single day and give it all you got and die on empty like I am and that's what he speaks to us today but it's a challenge for us in the culture we live in so how, how do we win that how do we how do we keep that kind of kind of going the first thing you have to do is be willing to inconvenience yourself look at the person you came with say inconvenience yourself I don't know how much at the time Paul understood the power of his ministry that his willingness to be inconvenienced would affect generation upon generation upon generation upon generation till ultimately till today in 2020. He still affects people. He still determines the teaching of the church. I mean, God slowed his whole ministry down, put him in jail so he would write most of his letters from prison where we get the doctrine and the theology that we stand on. Paul's willingness to be inconvenienced is something that you and I generations before us, and honestly, generations as after us, will benefit from. His willingness to be put in harm's way, to be put in a prison that, honestly, you and I would look at as absolutely humane. We don't have a real concept of what Roman prison looked like, but it was bad. And that's where he wrote, like, joy-filled letters, challenging letters, encouraging letters. And, and we have everything that we stand on, by the most part, in modern-day Christianity because Paul said, I'll be inconvenienced for your sake. What, what if you and I legitimately was okay being inconvenienced for the kingdom? Like if we legitimately would go out of our way to serve people, go out of our way to love people, go out of our way to serve God's house, like there are a group of people in here this morning prior to service. We have a 9.55 a.m. Um, like Holy Spirit moment where I like give them the three points because they're usually serving. And I honestly encourage them because they're making a decision to be inconvenienced. Isn't, listen, I know when you're a pastor, you're supposed to tell everybody, it's awesome. You're never more like Jesus when you're serving. And all of that's true, but this is true too. It's an inconvenience. Like, nobody shook their head yes because that makes you feel like a bad Christian, but we all know it to be the truth. It's an inconvenience to get up early. It's an inconvenience to get my kids dressed and not, not beat them all the way to church. It's an inconvenience not to have an argument with my wife about what we're serving and what we're doing. It's an inconvenience to get on the front door on time without a wrinkled shirt and actually look happy. It's an inconvenience to do all of that, but yet... Aren't you excited that there were people today that decided to inconvenience themselves so you could come and experience God? We, we all, as a family, have to be willing to inconvenience ourselves to serve God's house. We, we can't just continue to come and sit and take up space to be fed and encouraged all the time and not be a contributor to what the atmosphere in here is like. Like you just you just can't, and you go, oh yes, I can. Yes, you can, but you got to understand. Then you're choosing United States 21st century Christianity, not a kingdom culture. This is the only organization on the planet that exists for the people who aren't here. I'm not saying it doesn't exist for you. We are supposed to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. We are to disciple people and, and share with them and counsel with them, but we're also supposed to create an environment when somebody comes that they know this place matters to everybody. That this place is full of unity. This place is full of love. And so we have to be willing to inconvenience ourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, inconvenience yourself. 
And then it's not just on Sunday. We have to inconvenience ourselves Monday through Saturday. What does that mean? We can't be about our agenda all the time. We have to pay attention in the grocery store. We have to pay attention in Walmart. We have to pay attention at our job. We have to pay attention at our schools because why? You're a missionary in those places. Just because somebody goes to China does not make them more spiritual or better than you. God calls us to affect where we live first. And if we do really good with that, then he'll give us the opportunity to go to Africa. Learn to inconvenient yourself, especially in our culture, because we don't understand it. As a matter of fact, we try everything we can not to be. Embrace the uncomfortable so you can be effective. Um, the next thing we need to do is love Jesus. If I say Jesus, I want you to let this seek in. I'm going to read you a couple of scriptures, and I want you to let them seek in. So I'm going to go kind of slow here because I typically talk pretty fast. Love Jesus more than anything else. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Jesus speaking, and I quote, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on this earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Two, in my opinion, two very powerful commands, not suggestions. Like we, we, we miss that in Jesus' language. Jesus came, he said himself to fulfill the law, not do away with it. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. So he kind of narrowed all the commands of the Old Testament down into two. Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he goes on and explains what loving God with everything looks like. You can't love anything more than you love Jesus. So much so, you have to love me more than you love your spouse. You have to love me more than you love your kids. You have to love me more than you love your parents. That's hard to swallow. So if I was going to tell you to discuss anything this afternoon, it would be this right here. Be honest with yourself. Benet and I have been on this journey just this year of asking ourselves very, very um, challenging questions. When we came to the verse, this verse in our Bible study, Here's what she asked me, and here's what I asked her. Do you love God more than you love me? Now, here's what I want to challenge you to do. When you go this afternoon and you ask yourself that question concerning your spouse, your children, your mom, your dad, your whoever, just be honest. Don't give the Sunday school answer from here. Speak from here. Is that hard? Because I'm just going to be straight. I'll be as super authentic as I can. When she asked me that question, here was, my, here was my first response. Of course I do. Here's what she said. Really? I said, okay. I don't know. I want to believe I do. But here's what's difficult. I see you. I wake up next to you, I go to bed with you, I talk to you, I can touch you, I can feel you. We can argue back and forth and I can see your face. And I, I've committed to love you until death do us part. And I'm trying to love you as much as Christ loved the church. Well, how much energy have I put into loving God like I'm putting into loving her? And I just had to be honest and just truthfully say, I don't really know, babe. And immediately my mind was brought back to you're like not worthy of the kingdom if you can't get your priorities right. And the truth is, you'll never, I'll never love her in the way she wants to be loved until I love God more than her. So not to make anybody feel bad, I just, I really want our lives to be transformed. 
I really want us to take serious what is written down in the Word of God and not blow by it like it's a Sunday school thing and I can give the right answer, but it never changes who I am, the way I act, the way I operate. Because if you watched my life, you would 100% say, oh, he definitely loves Benet. Oh, you've ever seen us interact? Got a few of you. Right, like it's kissing and smooching and hanging out, dancing. Y'all have seen us on Instagram because Joshua's always sneaking around posting crap. He shouldn't be posting. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why he does that, but that's a thing. So you would definitely say, oh, they are 100% in love. But the, but the question is, is do you look at my life and can legitimately say, but I know he loves God more than her? Can I look at your life and say, no, I know he loves God more than his wife. I know she loves God more than her husband. I know they love God more than their job. I know they love God more than their kids. And it's not, it's not that you kick them to the curb. It's just that you keep the priorities right so that the love actually overflows and makes a difference in their lives. And guys, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. But it's one we have to answer. So be willing to be inconvenienced. Love Jesus more than anything else. We're actually going to land on that one a little bit more in week three. When we talk about living a life of no compromise. Zero. Because that's how much compromise you get in the kingdom. If you ever wondered, how, mu how much wiggle room do I get? That much. The third one is take risks. Take risks. Look at your neighbor and say, just chance it. How many of you love gambling? Come on, thank you so much. <laughs> Who else likes, come on, raise your, I saw it, somebody over there was like, I don't know, that's not, no, no. Everybody in here who likes, let's, let's roll the dice. Mama needs some tennis shoes, like whatever. Okay, <laughs> all right, let's just be honest. We're all, like there's, most of, most of the time it's guys, but like the truth is we kind of like gambling. We want to take a risk. We want to roll the dice. I mean, we, we like all that stuff. Well, listen, the kingdom of God is the only thing you can roll the dice on that'll land right every time. Like if you're going to gamble with something, and the most of the time we do gamble with our life, don't we? And we put our life on the line for a lot of stuff. Listen, if you're, if you're in here and you're like new to this, you're logged in, or you've been here a while, listen, if I were going to, how many of you that gambled, you raised your hand, you're always looking for a sure thing. I mean, that's, what, that's, what the, that's the great search of a gambling person. I want to bet on a sure thing. That's what we look for. We want to like, if we're, how many of you ever bet on horse races? Or dog, we're in Alabama, it's probably dog races, okay? I'm not making fun, it's just probably dog races. Anybody ever bet on a race of any kind? NASCAR, Okay, so um, what, what we want when we do that, I mean, I talk to people. I don't know for sure if this is how it works, but I heard. Um, what you want is you want the sure thing. You want to be able to call the bookie who knows the guy at the track who's telling you, hey, just so you know, it's all fixed and this guy's winning. Because I don't know if you know it or not, like gambling's not legal and it's never a sure thing unless you get the inside scoop. Like, if you don't gamble, you don't know this. If you gamble, you're going, he's right. I really would like to call the bookie and know who's, who's the dog that's crossing the finish line because everybody else got a lame leg. Or they shot that horse up with so-and-so, so he's about to get it. That's what we're looking for. We want a sure thing. Everybody say sure thing. And what I don't understand and what I can't comprehend is that God says, I'm telling you from the start to the end, I'm the sure thing. You will win every time if you bet on me. If you give me your life, if you go all in. Who's ever been to the poker table? Who's ever been to? Y'all a bunch of liars in here. There's so many y'all. Every time I ask a question, you're like, who's going to be first? Who's going to be? Listen, who's been to the poker table? Why did you do this? Not just to win big. You knew you had it. You didn't do that crap on a chance. You look at them cards and went, ain't nobody got these. It's full high. Whatever it is, because I don't play poker. Royal flush, whatever. I heard. Okay, so you're like, I got all y'all. And there were some people, when you did this, what'd they do? I'm out. Why? Because they knew. They knew nobody's doing that. Now, some of you bluffed and you got your butt handed to you, but that's okay. That's a learning. Like, you went all in and somebody called you like, crap. 
That means that never happened. Okay, so I, listen, you went all in because you knew it was a sure thing. God's saying to us, go all in. Inconvenient yourself. Love me with everything. Take risk on me because I'm the sure thing every time. But what if it doesn't feel like it was a sure thing? you got to back up and look at it from an eternal perspective. I would guess, I don't know, I would guess William Borden went all in, but maybe sometimes felt like, I feel like I'm crapping out. I feel like it's getting taken from me. But listen, we're in 2020, and I'm reading his life story and quoting his three statements in the back of his Bible that you would be inspired to live a life full and die empty. Was his life wasted? The answer is no, and we all know it. But we all bet on stuff that's going to leave us hanging. And God's just inviting us. I must say invitation. God's inviting us to take risks. How many know Elvis Presley? Is he still alive? Anybody? Okay. The king lives. Okay, so... I will tell you this, we did not go to the moon. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So, <laughs> that just messed y'all up. You're like, what? Okay, so, <laughs> Jesus. Um, here's some things you may not know about the king. Um, Elvis was actually considered one of the greatest music failures at the start of his career. Um, I just, I don't know why, I just looked him up. I thought, well, who was one of like, the greatest failures in all the earth? And his name came up. Um, Elvis failed music class. <laughs> um, he was considered by his peers and his teachers to be a um, social misfit. He was working actually as a truck driver while he was trying to get his recording career off the ground. And after playing his first gig, his manager said, and I quote, you ain't going nowhere, son. You need to go back to driving that truck. But Elvis pressed in. Elvis wouldn't quit. He kept, he kept going in. He actually joined a quartet. They canceled him his first audition because they told him, you cannot sing. Now all of us now on this side, I go, what you talking about? That's the king of rock and roll. But when he started out, everybody was against him. Everybody told him, you're not worth it. You failed music class. You can't really sing. You need to move on. But over the courses of Elvis's life, he achieved some of the highest accolades in music and film. It is estimated that more than one billion Elvis records have been sold worldwide. Elvis starred in 31 feature films. Elvis has had 150 different albums and singles that have been certified gold, platinum, or multi-platinum. Elvis has had no less than 149 songs um, appear on Billboard's Top 100. 114 of these were in the top 40. 40 were in the top 10. 18 were number one. His number one single spent 80 weeks at number one. More than 90 Elvis Presley records reached the charts, with 10 of them reaching number one as a record and whole. And these statistics are only in the United States of America. Why did he succeed? Because he wouldn't quit. He was willing to roll the dice. He was willing to take the risk. Look at your neighbor and say, take the risk. You've got to be willing To live full. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and live it to the full. Live life full, but make sure that when you are, when the roll is called up yonder. Who remembers that song? Okay. When the roll is. Yeah, I don't know it. But anyway, like when it's, when it's, I didn't grow up in church, so I really don't know it. That's all I know. When the roll is called up yonder. So, all right. Okay. So, but when it's called, when you're, when you're, when you're at the end and we're talking about the dash. Everybody know the dash? When it's over, it's all been said and done, and we're singing at your funeral, make sure that there was nothing left. Make sure you died on empty. It's a famous story in 2 Kings. I'm going to tell it to you really quick. The guy's name is Elisha. Elisha does twice as many miracles as his predecessor, Elijah. And there's some Moabites invading the country one day, and 
they're digging this guy a grave and they see the Moabites raiding, so they get scared and they just chuck this dude in on Elisha's grave. And the guy comes to life because he touches Elisha's bones. How dope would that be? Like you just throw on a dead guy, boom, you're alive. And I'm not taking away from Elisha, I'm not taking away of what his miracles were and how powerful he was, but is it possible that because he didn't die on empty, there was one more left in him? You ever look at that and look at Scripture and go, yeah, that's very powerful. Now, he was so anointed that when they touched his bones, he came to life. Or did he miss it and have one more in him that he should have got out before he died? What if he'd have been so empty at death, they were just bones? That's how I want to live. And I struggle like you to live like that every day. I, I listen, I'm just like you. I get caught up in my agenda. I get caught up in my marriage. I get caught up with my kids. I get caught up in doing my thing. And I have to be shooken and brought back to a kingdom reality and not what I see. I get just as concerned about everything that's going on in this world as you do. And it can pull me away from an eternal perspective. And in this series, I think God wants to shake us to say, listen, listen, listen. What you see does not matter. It's the unseen that matters. It's the person, let me tell you what I think that means. It is the spiritual, but it's also the people that are unseen that matters. The people that when you go to Publix, you go to Walmart, you go to school, you go to your job that are the unseen people. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? The unseen people. The unseen people is what matters. The unseen people are the ones that God wants you to go after. The unseen people are the one that God wants you to inconvenience yourself and help. Share the gospel with, invite them to church, to love Jesus more than you love being like goofy and awkward and it's weird to take a risk. What if they don't come to church? What if they do? What if they don't get saved? What if they do? What if I pray for them and they don't get healed? What if they do? Let's move to the positive side of following God instead of worrying about all the stuff that could go wrong. What about all the stuff that could go right? And Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes brings us to that point in today's conversation. In Ecclesiastes 11, 4 through 6, this first verse I'm going to read you might be one of the most funny verses in all of Scripture. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain on the earth. But say amen. And whether a tree falls toward the south or toward the north, listen to this. Wherever the tree falls, there it is. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that wisdom. <laughs> Verse 4. One who watches the wind will not sow, and one who looks at the clouds will not harvest. Just as you do not know the path of the wind, how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes everything. Verse 6, listen to this. Sow your seed in the morning. Do not be idle in the evening, for you do not know whether one or the other will succeed. Listen to this. Or whether both of them will alike be good. What's the wisest person on the planet saying? Hey, just so you know, if a tree falls, there it is. And we all go, amen. And he also says, just like that is certain, you don't know where the wind blows or where it comes from, and you don't know what God is up to. And if you're looking for the per perfect opportunity to sow the seed, to share the story, to invite, to live out the kingdom, if you're looking for the perfect circumstances, they don't exist. And you're going to miss it. So do yourself a favor and do the whole world a favor. Just do it. Just sow the seed. Because you know what you don't know? That one might explode and produce a lot of fruit. Or all of them that you sow might explode and produce fruit all at the same time. What if all 10 people that you invite to church this week show up? Because you don't know. You don't know what God's doing in their life and in their heart and in their mind where he spoke to you. I want you to go talk to that person in Walmart. I want you to go talk to that person in Publix. I want you to go pray for that person. I want you to go do this. I can almost guarantee you God's speaking to them before he ever told you to speak. He's inviting you in to his kingdom and his plan and his movement. So what do you have to do? You have to inconvenience yourself. There's no other way around it. And it is inconvenient. Let's stop being super spiritual like it's not. It is. But is it worth it? Is it worth it? Love Jesus more than anything else. 
Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And be honest if you're struggling with it, with somebody and with him. And let him grow you to that place. Take a risk. Because you only live life once. There is no second time around. There is no do-over in the 75 to 120 years that you'll be here. You get today. In my opinion, you've spent it wisely coming and worshiping the Lord and being under the instruction of the Word. Now here's my question. What are you going to do with the rest of the afternoon? What's the rest of your afternoon look like? Can you walk away and be aware? And I'm not saying that you got to go and be an evangelist. But maybe, maybe serve and love your wife as Christ loved the church. Maybe honor your husband as you honor the Lord and submit to him. Maybe instruct your kids and have have lunch with them. Maybe spend some time with family who are outside. Maybe pay attention in Publix when you go there because you're going to start shopping for Thanksgiving before it's too late. I mean, maybe just be aware, inconvenience yourself, love Jesus, and take a risk and watch God do something amazing in your life. Somebody say amen. amen. Father God, thank you so much for today. You, sir, are awesome. And we do say we love you. And in all this, what we say we love you as much as we know how. So God, teach us to love you even more, to love you more than anything else. God, let us embrace the uncomfortable and the inconvenient to be your hands and your feet. And let us be willing to take risks because your kingdom is worth it. If you're in here today and you've never embraced Jesus as your forgiver and leader, I wonder if you'd be willing to take a risk today and bet your life on a sure thing. Go all in on a sure thing. Because the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you'll be saved. What are you saved from? Yourself, your sin, your shortcomings. God wants to forgive you, restore you, redeem you, put a new mind, a new heart in you and place his spirit on the inside of you that you can live life to the full and invite you to die on empty. If that's you today, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, God, I'm a sinner. I've messed up so many times I can't even count. But today I choose you. I believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God, that he died on the cross for my sin and rose to life on the third day. Father, I invite you to be Lord of my life. God, thank you for those who made that decision and prayed that prayer. Holy Spirit, fill them to overflowing. Let them be confident that they were transformed today. If you prayed that prayer with me, I would so appreciate if you would go to the Connect Center and let somebody know. We don't ask people to come down front in this church because we believe baptism is when you go public, but I want you to let somebody know today so they can pray with you and help you understand your next steps. Father, it was great to be in your house. May everything that we said and do be honoring to you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Love you, church. See you next week.